Well, today I'm joined by the Reverend Dr. Hans Borsma. He is St. Benedict, Servant of Christ, Chair in Ascetical Theology at Neshota House Theological Seminary, and author of over a dozen books, including Pierced by Love, Divine Reading with the Christian Tradition, which we'll be discussing today. It was an absolute pleasure reading this book. I really enjoyed it. And we're going to talk a lot about the concept of Lectio Divina today. But before we get there, at the outset of your book, you write that we must read Scripture according to the purpose of Scripture, which sounds straightforward enough. But to start, what is the purpose of Scripture? The purpose is to draw us closer to God, to um, allow us to share in the divine life. Divinization, in other words, is the purpose. God himself is happiness, as the entire tradition has taught us. God is happiness, and he wants us to be happy with his happiness. And so the purpose is contemplation. That's exactly what Lectio Divina aims at, the contemplation of God himself. So the highest aim that we could possibly think of, uh, namely to be united to God himself. I love that. And it's slightly different than what I think some of us would have grown up hearing, which we'll touch on in just a second. But I want to get at another idea you talk about in your book that I think also might be new to some people. And that is the idea of scripture as a sacrament. So what do you mean by this when you talk about scripture as a sacrament? Maybe how might that inform our reading when we understand scripture as sacrament? Yeah, thank you for that. That's a great question. Um, The notion that scripture is a sacrament is closely linked to the practice of Lectio Divina or divine reading or meditative reading. Um, When you say that scripture is a sacrament, you're using the the language of sacrament in a somewhat unusual way. Usually when people think of of sacraments, they think of baptism, Eucharist, or one of the the other sacraments of the church. Um, But in in the early church, the word sacrament was used much more broadly or widely than we tend to use it. So um, a sacrament is, is an outward thing that contains, hidden within it, as it were, that contains a truth or a reality. And the scriptures contain a truth or a reality. That truth, that reality contained within the scriptures, within the sacrament, is Christ himself. And so the scriptures aim to make Christ present to us. When I talked earlier about contemplation, about being united to God, the happiness of God. Um, that's, I, I didn't mention Jesus Christ, but really that's one and the same thing as saying the scriptures aim to make Christ present to us. For the final goal of the human journey, seeing God face to face, the beatific vision, is to see God in Jesus Christ. And so the, the reality, the truth of the, of the scriptures, the heart of it, is 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 the sacramental reality of christ himself that means that no matter what you read or where you read in the bible the aim is always the ultimate aim at least is always to see god in jesus christ i think for many of us we were taught to read scripture to essentially kind of mine bible facts in a way right to kind of get our theology straight to understand the the narrative and to kind of be able to maybe memorize scripture so that we're ready at a given time, that we'd have kind of scripture handy for us. And it's not that any of those things are necessarily bad, but you do point out in your book that when we approach scripture primarily as a historian, which I think is a big part of the kind of historical grammatical method that many of us have been taught, especially in Protestant circles, you write that when we approach scripture as a historian, it, it we're not getting the the full fullness of scripture from that approach. And I imagine it has to do with the sacramental reality, but maybe to kind of double click on that idea, what falls short in this kind of prevailing method of looking at scripture as history and using that kind of historical grammatical approach? Yeah, let, let me first first uh, give a little caveat before I answer your question. And the caveat is this, um, the book that I've written is, is in, in no way really a polemical book. Um, I, I do some, I engage in some polemics elsewhere, also against uh, a strictly grammatical histor- or a grammatical historical method, as you call it. But in this book, I don't do that. And, and the reason I don't do it is that I want, wanted to positively set out uh, how it is that we might use the scriptures, as you put it, sacramentally to, to 
help us to struggle through the text toward God in Jesus Christ. Um, and, and so I leave the polemics pretty much entirely alone in this book. Now it is true, of course, and, and your, your question is a perceptive one. It is true that, that my positive exposition does have, does have a, a somewhat negative uh, counter, counterpart. And that is, if we, if we treat the Bible in a strictly historical sense, and if we see ourselves as Bible readers, uh, primarily as historians, so that the purpose is to find out, to figure out some historical uh, artifact. If we see ourselves, in other words, as archaeologists, you could also say, um, turning to some ancient, ancient text in order to find out what was the case once upon a time, something, something along those lines. Um, we, we may find all sorts of interesting tidbits and all sorts of significant and perhaps important tidbits, but we have missed the main point. Lexi Divina has, has four steps, you see, um, reading, meditation, prayer, and contemplation. And, and the first one reading, Lexio, um, that's where the historical side comes in. And that's where the investigative side that you talk about, the intellectual side, as it were, where that comes in. Um, it's, it's not like that doesn't matter or is unimportant. And I make a point in my book of, of highlighting that it is quite important, but it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. Um, we approach the scripture, not primarily as historians, but as theologians who, and, and theology in the ancient sense of the term to be mystically united uh, to God himself. Theology speaks of, of the Trinity himself, the, tri the, the triune God himself. So um, history, is it important? Absolutely. Is it indispensable? Absolutely. Is it the ultimate thing? By no means. That's helpful. And I appreciate that, that distinction there. And also the, the note that this isn't a polemic, and, and that's certainly not what people are going to find in this book. And so to get to the more positive part, let, let's talk a little bit about Lectio Divina. It's not a new concept, though it might be new to some of my viewers. You mentioned kind of the four steps there, but for someone that's completely new to Lectio Divina, how would how would you describe this approach to Scripture beyond just the steps? What, what's the heart of Lectio Divina? Um, I begin the book by saying that Lectio Divina is nothing out of the ordinary. It it's what you what you naturally do when you when you read the Scripture. Any ordinary Christian. You or I, when we pick up the Bible, we read it because we want to know God and Jesus Christ better. Um, likewise, when I write a sermon or when any, any pastor or priest writes a sermon for Sunday morning, um, he reads the text um, with a view to um, encountering God in that text. And through that encounter, uh, speak into the lives of his parishioners, so that they too may have a close encounter with God in Jesus Christ. Um, that's that's basically what Lectio Divina does, and so it's nothing out of the ordinary. When we we, we when we think of four steps, um, we we may easily think, oh, that's something esoteric or or or, or, or weird. Um, that's something that monks did in the 12th century, perhaps. Um, well, no to the first, it's not esoteric or weird. And yes to the second, it's true that monks did it in the 12th century. But it's also true that we all still do that when we, when we read the scriptures. Why? Because the scriptures are meant for meditating. We read and we meditate, we repeat. You briefly mentioned earlier in a question, memorizing. Memorizing was hugely important throughout the tradition. When you, when you meditate on the text, it becomes part of you. you, you you memorize it. And then you cannot help but pray over it. When you write a sermon, any, any pastor or priest will know when you, when you write a sermon, you, you're, 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 you cannot but pray over the text because the text confronts you um, and, and you see your own life reflected in, in the text. And so you end up praying in all sorts of different ways. And finally, um, the aim of all that is to contemplate God, to, to, to stand in awe, in the awe of silence before, before the God whom you love in Christ. 
Um, that's that's a, that's basically the Christian journey, the the peregrinatio, as Augustine calls it, the, the pilgrimage toward the homeland, toward heaven, toward God. Yeah, I want to kind of put a a kind of finer point on one of these ideas that we've talked about, uh, and that is of encountering God in Scripture. Now, for some of my audience, when they, they might love reading Scripture, and for them, it might be this experience where that that describes what they feel like is happening when they read the Scripture, that they feel like they are having an encounter with God. And it's not just them coming to the text, but the text is almost reaching back out to them. I think for other people, that might not describe their experience thus far with Scripture. They might say, I really struggle with Scripture, and I, I come to it, and it kind of feels like this dead text. And maybe they wouldn't say that out loud because they don't like the way that that would sound. But I think if mm-hmm. some people are being honest, encountering God doesn't feel like what's happening in their reading of Scripture. So what does it mean to encounter God in Scripture? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, the the encouraging, encouraging first response, perhaps, is you're not the first one who experiences perhaps sometimes the text as something dead or or perhaps experiences your heart as 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 hard or as dead or as unfeeling before the text and and the text just doesn't speak to you at all um and the text doesn't seem to transfigure you at all those sorts of non experiences uh, are are things that that um, Christians throughout the centuries have struggled with, and that that prominent theologians and spiritual masters themselves um, struggled with. Um, in in the book, I have a chapter called "The Bread of Tears," uh, and and the reason for that for that title it's a title from the psalmist from Psalm eighty, um, the, the bread of tears. Um, Christ is the bread. Christ is the bread that we eat. And when we're, when we're when Christ pierces our hearts, um, the intent is uh, that we experience Him. But uh, several of the of, of the of the monastic um, spiritual writers that I look at mention that so often the tears don't come. The experience of of faith seems seems well, like you're saying, it seems dead, um, and. So they're asking, what if the experience is not there? Um, how can how can I possibly um, make make this biblical passage or, or the biblical text my own? How can it possibly become my own? And how can I possibly encounter Jesus? Um, the main thing, although that struggle can be intense, and some of the writers that I, I look at did apparently experience it. In a very intense way, this or this non-experience of, of God in, in in and through the biblical text. Um, the the main thing is to keep going back to the scriptures. Now, I'm I'm talking here only about Lectio Divina and about the Bible. The Bible is one means of grace, but I should also say, if if you don't go to church on Sunday morning at all, you should not be surprised that the biblical text doesn't speak to you. There may be certain things in your life that may hamper the encounter between you and the biblical text. There may be sinful patterns in your life that hamper, again, the encounter between the biblical text and your, and, and your own life. Um, <clears throat> but assuming all of those other things um, are, are not at stake, um, the key thing is faithfulness. The key thing is habit forming. Uh, um, habitus, hexis in Greek, keep going back. Um, the, the encounter with the biblical text needs to be a recurring pattern in your life. Um, there will be times that your reading will, be, will seem as dry as can be. But that doesn't mean that under the surface you're not being, being, being shaped. Um, sometimes... Uh, John Cassian, for example, in the fifth century, makes the point: sometimes you 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 meditate upon the scriptures, and 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 it doesn't say much to you. And then when you lie in bed later on, all of a sudden you're startled, and you think, "Oh," and and something grips you in in what you've read. 
um, maybe because you've come at rest, maybe because uh, there are other things that you're thinking about and the text connects to those things. Um, life, is, life is unpredictable. And, and amidst that unpredictability and amidst all those twists and turns, um, God simply calls us to be faithful. This book talks a lot about experience, but the aim is not to get a spirit of, of the aim of, of, of spiritual reading is not to get a spiritual high. The aim is to encounter God in Jesus Christ. And that means simply being faithful. This video is brought to you in part by Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is an organization of Christian counselors that exists to help you get the help you need. You can find them by going to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. And when you use that link, which you can find in the description down below, you will get 10% off your first month and they'll pair you up with a licensed mental health counselor in under 48 hours. Once you've been paired up with a counselor, you can reach them via instant message, phone call, video call, and more. I think you will really enjoy this and I think it could be the first step on your journey to greater mental health. And mental health problems affect all of us, religious, non-religious, old, young, every demographic feels the weight of mental health but there are resources available and you don't need to go through this alone, which is why I encourage you to reach out to the amazing people at Faithful Counseling by using that link, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity and taking your first step towards healing and wholeness in your mental health. I think that's a really important note to put at kind of the front end of this conversation that we are going to talk about experience a lot and it's, it's a big part of the book, but that it's not about the spiritual high. I really loved the way that you put that because I think when we make that the ultimate goal of our reading, we can feel as though everything short of that isn't worthwhile. And if we're not experiencing this emotional high, then something in us isn't working or maybe we're doing it wrong or maybe our reading doesn't mean anything there. But I also appreciate the way that not only is it that that's not true, but that sometimes it's not an immediate thing. Sometimes it's not till afterwards, and maybe it's in the context right. of community, or then when you're in church that you experience this. And I was going to ask this later on, but I want to follow up on this now before we go too <laughs> far down the journey of, of Lectio Divina and getting a little more in the weeds here, which I'm really excited to do. But within this, we're, we're going to talk a lot about kind of our individual interaction with Scripture. But I know you're a man that loves the church and loves the tradition. And so as we think about our individual reading with scripture. How do we locate that within a love for the church and for the tradition such that our practice of Lectio Divina isn't like this spiritual but not religious practice? Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I like the fact that you allude to the spiritual but not religious because somewhere in the book, I forget where, but I, I, um, I mentioned this as... Is, is, is Lectio Divina, I ask in, in one of the introductions to the chapters, to one of the chapters, I ask the question, well, is, is Lectio Divina um, something that's, that's really, well, sleep-inducing, soporific, and, and that, that um, is, is really suitable for people who want to be spiritual, want to get a spiritual high, as I mentioned earlier, um, but, but who don't like institutions, who don't like... Um, the boundaries that come with with institutional religious life, so spiritual but not religious. Um, that that's a common twentieth and twenty first century phenomenon. Um, but we should keep in mind that that lecture divina um, never was that. None of none of the people that I look at in this book, and and I, I trace theologians from as far back as origin in the third century um, to um, 20th century uh, theologians um, in, in the Catholic tradition, like Joseph Ratzinger and others, uh, none of them um, would have, would have, um, would have echoed that sort of sentiment that we should be spiritual but not religious. Lectio Divina functioned first of all, function in a communal setting. It functioned in a monastic setting. Um, and I talk about those monastic communities a fair bit in the book. Um, 
an individual reading of the scriptures, such as Lectio Divina is indeed, is never a purely subjective reading of the scriptures. It's always a reading that is bounded by liturgical exegesis, by exegesis that's grounded within the liturgy of the church, because it is the liturgy, after all, um, that gives us the faith of the church. And so the communal experience of faith of the entire church, uh, both diachronically and synchronically, um, the, the, the creedal confines or the creedal, um, creedal wellspring of the church, those, those are the, are the um, sources, those are the foundations. Um, or you could also say that the, those form the soil within which um, Lectio Divina can flourish. If you don't have those communal contexts, um, and, and if you don't have that communal soil, um, Lectio Divina can actually become a, a problematic practice because um, then, then if, if it is true that scripture and, 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 and that scripture on the one hand and my life on the other hand, if, that they encounter one another, if my life, the subjective side of that um, is not anchored in, in um, the way that the scriptures have been read throughout the tradition is not creedally anchored, isn't liturgically anchored. Um, then, then it's just my my personal feelings, how I, as as an individual person within my own context, how I experience things. Um, that that all gets read into the scriptures, and that certainly wouldn't have been. That certainly wasn't the way in which. Um, the, the practice functioned in the monastic tradition that I look at in the book. Well, let's go to that monastic tradition because I find few things as interesting as medieval monks. And, and for that reason, my wife tells me that I should find new hobbies. But I think we might find a uh, similar joy in this. And so you devote a chapter of your book to the concept of ladders, which I think was really great. And I think it's uh, like spiritual acrophobia, I think is something like the title there. And in it, you highlight several ladders from the Christian tradition. It turns out there's actually a lot of these, and it's not just the ladder of divine ascent that maybe a lot of people are familiar with. But I want to look at one specifically, which comes from a medieval monk named Guigo, and it's his ladder of monks. So I'm guessing a lot of my audience might not be familiar with this. I think it's a fascinating concept. So to start, can you just give us an overview of this ladder of monks and maybe how that ties in to this concept of Lectio Divina. Yeah, um, so Guigo II was, in a, was a Cistercian abbot in the, um, in the 12th century. And he wrote this uh, really little handbook, you could almost call it, uh, Scala Castralium, uh, Ladder of Monks. And um, in it, he, he basically gives a very basic um, instruction to other monks, telling them how it is that they might read the scriptures to their prophet. And, and he says, um, you could do it by taking four steps. So it's a ladder with only four steps in his case, uh, often the ladders that, um, that I talk about in the book have more step, steps, sometimes seven, sometimes 12, sometimes 33, but, but his, only, his only has four steps. Um, and, and the, the aim is to reach the highest step. So the first one is Lexio, he says, reading. Um, and here you simply carefully read the text, hopefully out loud to yourself. Um, and then after you have read the text, you read it again, you read it again. And as you continue to read it again, um, you, you cannot but begin to meditate upon it. You start to think about its implications. You wonder what the link is between this text or these few words or this phrase, what the link is between it and, and the faith of the church, what the link is between it and Jesus Christ. How is it that we can see Christ in this text? What is the link between this particular phrase and the, and the words around it, the, the entire chapter perhaps, or the entire Psalm perhaps? Um, do we see similar words elsewhere in the scriptures? Um, the, all, all of that and, and more things are involved in, in that meditation. And as you meditate deeply, 
um, the text, or, or I should perhaps put it differently, God through the text, the spirit through the text begins to speak to you. And you begin to see certain things that the text means to do in your, in your life um, that you had not noticed before. And they, they perhaps convict you of, of certain sins. Um, they perhaps make you deeply aware of, of, of ways in which God has been gracious to you. Um, and as you begin to think about these things, you pray over them. You confess to God. You offer your thanks to God. You praise the Lord. All, all of these different approaches can come to the fore. And I should mention, um, the confessing of one's sin, compunction, is, is, is a big one throughout Christian tradition. And, and maybe we can come back to that later. But I just want to highlight that. Um, that, that introspection and confession is, is a big one. Um, and so that's the third step. First you have reading, lexio. Then you have meditation, meditatio. Then you, you, you because, of, because the text confronts you with your life, you enter into prayer, oratio. And finally, fourthly, um, you, you rest in peace and contemplation of God himself. Um, and um, this contemplatio is, is, is a foretaste for Guigo, a foretaste of, of eternal life, a foretaste of the beatific vision. Um, and now he, he, he explains these, these four steps in all sorts of wonderful ways. Um, I have a chart in the book that explains carefully uh, the various aspects of each of these each of these steps on the ladder. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful little instruction instruction uh, manual and uh, very readable. Still for still today, it's about fifty pages or so, um, and it's 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 the booklet that I send people to first when 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 they ask me about Lexi Divina. That's wonderful, and yeah. You and the team did a wonderful job in this book with the the charts, the visuals. Uh, just a shout out to Lexum and all the work that they do as well with the covers and everything. It, it looks great. I want to talk about one of the concerns you bring up when you're talking about ladders in your book, whether that's uh, Guigos or Climacuses or any number of these. It can make certain people a bit squeamish, right? It for one of two reasons, and that's whether we're talking about our engagement with scripture or kind of our our just uh, Christian walk as that of a moving up a ladder, which is all over the place in the medieval period and other periods as well. But people often have one of two or both concerns. One is that we're kind of making salvation, we're, we're making this all just kind of a matter of like ramping up enough effort to get there and that it's um, it's by our own power that we're climbing these ladders. But then there's also kind of a worry that we're being maybe a bit elitist and that like only certain people could reach that high. And I think it's, it's something I want to bring up at this point, especially as we're going to get into maybe some other medieval figures here as well, that for some people listening, they, they might feel like, man, are we talking about something that's only accessible to a monk? Like if, if I'm, you know, not a monk, is this just... Is this at a spiritual level that I'll never reach? So could you talk about maybe that concern specifically here and how this yeah. isn't yeah. just something for medieval monks? It is it is indeed for everyone. Before I go there, uh, let, let me let me make, make one additional comment, and it's this. Um, to ramp up our effort um, is a really good thing. <laughs> We all should ramp up our effort in the Christian life. We should run the race, as the Apostle Paul puts it. Um, it's a really important thing. Sometimes um, we're, we're so afraid of, of, of a certain moralism or a, or a certain works righteousness or whatever we may call it, um, that, we, that we put away all, all efforts at Christian living as, as being out of bounds. The Christian life is a struggle. It's meant to be a struggle. And it's only through struggling that we come to see the face of God. Um, so ramping up efforts is, is, is indispensable. Um, and the second comment, so that about the moralism side of things, and the other one about, is it only for monks, elitism? Um, 
um, I mean, we're, we're such um, democratically inclined people. We're such egalitarians. We, we think everybody's got to be exactly at the same level. Um, but, but again, St. Paul makes a distinction between drinking milk and, and eating meat. Um, and he, he tells us to, to um, stretch forth to reach the heavenly goal in, in Philippians 3.13. Um, so, so, um, I know, I'm no mother, mother Teresa and, and I, I worry that I'll never will be a mother Teresa, at least not on this side of, 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 of the heavenly future. So there are differences among Christians and we are to strive to reach the heavenly goal and to be, uh, as Christ like as possible. Um, now that said, now that I've got that out of my system, as it were, um, let me answer your question. Um, is, is it true that we have a negative sort of, oh, you got to do it all in your own strength? In Lectio Divina, climb the ladder really, really hard and do that all alone. And, and, and is it true, therefore, that you know, only the true athletes can do that on their own strength and that they leave the rest of us in the dust? No to both of those questions. Um, and, and the monks actually were keenly aware of that. Um, such, such an approach, um, to the Christian life that we, we earn our own stripes as it were, that we pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps cannot but lead to pride and pride is a deadly danger. It's, it's, it's the primal sin for many of the church fathers. Um, <clears throat> It's the very opposite of, of the humility that they insist we should pursue. So when, when um, for example, um, uh, St. Benedict in his rule advises the monks to climb certain steps, um, he, he highlights humility. It's a ladder of humility. Um, you, you, you climb up by debasing yourself, by humbling yourself. Um, there's a law, in, in other words, um, there, there's an I ironic, paradoxical, perhaps, inversion here where, where you think, oh, I'm going to do it and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna climb and I'm proud that I can do, the, I can do this. Whereas, whereas in reality, it is only by counting others better, better than yourself, um, by humbling yourself, they actually make progress in the Christian life. They actually do climb, climb the steps. Um, so it's the very opposite of, of, of doing this on your own and by your own strength. It's also important to note that each of these authors recognize the need for the gifting of the Holy Spirit, recognize the need for the, for the assistance of the, um, of the community of, of the entire monastery or the entire church and recognize um, the need to for the assistance of angelic powers to resist demonic forces. Um, the Christian is never alone in 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 this climb up the ladder. It is always graciously helped um, by the Holy Spirit, by angels, by other Christians, and and only so in that context can he can he humbly pursue pursue the climb upward. There's so much I'd love to say here. First of all, I really appreciated your comment on moralism there. I think in our great effort to maybe avoid like a works-based righteousness, we've done such a disservice in making trying hard almost this, this vice and that not trying too hard becomes a virtue because I guess then we trust in the yes. grace all the more. But but really, I think, especially in, in Protestant circles, I'll speak to that because that's that's kind of what I know best. Um, it, there's there's a real danger there and that we, we do want to remember that the, the Christian life isn't easy and it's something that does take work and it's something that does take effort. So I loved loved your comments on that and your, your note on kind of the egalitarian uh obsession that we have is also interesting right so it's one thing to say that it's not only monks that can do this but it would be a different thing to say that and therefore everyone does it 
equally well on their first attempt. On that note, though, I do think there's something interesting to note here. I, I highlighted this you know, objection because, one, you bring it out in your book, and I think it's something that listeners might think about. And I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this, though, because I think we could spin it around and say, when we take this view of Scripture as a sacrament and that we're really encountering God in this, in a way that feels like it should be more accessible because in the text, we're, we're encountering God, so it's not just us bringing our energy to it, but actually we're meeting God there, and, and by nature we're going to encounter grace in that. But on the other hand, and I know we're not getting into polemics today, but if we kind of had a solely like historical grammatical approach, it's easy to think that you need almost like a, a PhD and a background in Hebrew to make heads or tails of the text. And so while I think that's maybe a something to worry about, um, or at least something to think through, I think it, it's pretty easy to flip that around the other way and become maybe even more problematic in some ways. Yes, if I understand your question well, oh, the, the worry that you're expressing is that if you take a strictly historical approach to the text, um, then then you might you might be tempted to think, well, by my by my own efforts, my, my own academic efforts, um, I, I'm I'm mastering the text, as it were. Is that what you're after in your question? Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to do is kind of show that. A similar concern of like, is this only is it, is there an elitism to this approach? Could be right. levied at the inverse right. as well. That absolutely, it's it's easy to feel like unless you know Hebrew and Greek, like you've yeah. got no chance. Yeah, um, it's it's a big worry of mine, frankly. Um, we we have replaced the hierarchy of of the medieval church in in, in many of our churches. We've replaced it with an academic hierarchy. Um, you, you need you need a certain um, academic ability before you you can understand the meaning or grasp the meaning of the text. Um, I think such an uh, such an approach removes the scriptures from the hands of God's people. I can't I cannot tell you how many students um, I've had, especially actually interestingly, often some some of the students who who are both really quite bright and recognize also, therefore, perhaps their own their own limitations. Um, they they tend to think, well, I I I, sh I may be bright, but I cannot possibly I cannot possibly attain to the kind of kind of biblical scholarship that allows me to solve all all theological conundrums that I may encounter, and 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 so they shove the text away from them. They become afraid to preach. They become afraid to read the bible with spiritual intent um, they're afraid because they've learned that to grasp the meaning of the text is to understand exactly what the author meant once upon a time authorial intent in other words um, um, such an approach does indeed introduce a new elitism it's it's an academic elite that tells us now how to read the text and again we've removed the text from the laity the, the bible from the laity um in in actual fact in actual fact um the aim of of biblical interpretation is not to try and find the one true meaning of the text there is no such thing um and when you read the earlier tradition um, time and time again, um, you, you find them saying, well, the text may mean this. The text may, mean, may also mean that. Perhaps there's a third meaning to this text. Uh, Augustine does that. Gregor Nyssa does that. Maximus Confessor does that. They all do that. Um, and and the, 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 the metaphysical reason why they do it, the philosophical reason, if you want to use that term, um, is... is that they believe that the text has an infinite wealth because it is a spirit given text. It's not just an ordinary text, it's divine scripture, it's sacred scripture. And therefore um, it presents us with God himself who's infinite. And God as, an, as a God who's infinite um, reaches out to us, stoops down to us in these biblical words um, with the intent that we might be drawn into his infinite life. Um, that's not going to happen if, if, if 
all you're interested in as a reader is the one true historical meaning of the text. Um, so yeah, I want to echo your concern. There is an elitism in in much contemporary biblical scholarship, and we need to go back uh, to a, a to the to the um, uh, profundity and and fecundity of of of, this, of the divine scriptures. So I can't help but follow up on the, the point that the, the aim of Scripture is not to get to the, the one kind of meaning of the text, but that we're talking about meanings, plural. I agree with you. I noticed something interesting in this, though, and I'd, I'd be curious if if you've noticed something or if you can maybe get underneath the, the cause of this. Generally speaking, within uh, the those who really push for, like, there is one meaning to the text, it's authorial intent, and that's the only meaning. I generally find that coincides, maybe not always, but often, with a bit of a, a lower church or kind of uh, like a, a less high view of the, the church and the tradition. And I imagine, perhaps, that's because there's a fear of, well, if it can be multiple things, that there's kind of no boundaries because there's no one to set those boundaries. I notice, on the other hand, within kind of higher church traditions, whether there's a magisterium or we're looking to the, the tradition and the councils, etc., there can be a bit more comfort with saying there's multiple meanings because we do have some type of boundaries. We're not saying the text can mean anything, but we're going to read the text within the, the tradition there. I'd, I'd be curious if, one, kind of what what's your experience been of working through, I'm sure you get pushback on that point of kind of, a multivalent, like multiple meanings. Never, there. never. <laughs> never, right? <laughs> and do you see any trends of maybe where that might come from? Yeah, I, I think your observation is, is, is correct. Um, um, and, and interestingly, um, the, the attempt to find the one true meaning of the text stems from a really good desire um, and, and, and a really good intent and that is to uphold the authority of, of the scriptures. The worry here is, uh, it's a worry that many people from a especially reformed and evangelical uh, background have. Uh, the worry is um, that if we, if we allow for, allow for, right? If we allow for multiple interpretations of the text, um, then there are no boundaries indeed. And, and the scriptures cannot possibly be authoritative anymore. The scriptures cannot give us the word of God um, for our lives, it cannot authoritatively tell us doctrine, cannot authoritatively tell us how to live, etc., etc. Uh, because it becomes it becomes a, a plast, plastic thing. We can do with it as we like in that case. It's an understandable concern, and to some extent I think it's it's a legitimate concern, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, <clears throat> The, the earlier approach, um, the approach of, of the church fathers and of the Middle Ages, and as you rightly observe, an approach that continues uh, to some, to a large extent at least, uh, within Orthodoxy and within Catholicism, um, is, is, is not to say, well, it's, it's a free-for-all. We, we can interpret any way we like. <laughs> that sort of subjectivism is one is, is something that I've already uh, harped at earlier on in, in my discussion with you. Um, the scriptures um, must be interpreted in line with the tradition, must be interpreted in line with the creeds of the church, must be must be interpreted in line with the liturgy of the church, must be interpreted um, in line with the consent of the fathers. All of those things set set parameters. Um, within those parameters, however, um, we always need to search for the scripture's meaning, which is to say, we need to search for, for meaning um, in, the, in the deeper sense of that term, not, not as a puzzle to be solved, but as a mystery to be entered into. Puzzles don't give you meaning. Puzzles give you solutions hopefully. Um, but, but mysteries, the mystery of God in Christ in particular, that's what gives you meaning. And, and the scriptures are to be read with a view to that deeper hidden meaning 
um, through which um, and, and in which we are to enter the life of God. Um, if it is true, let me try to, this from a slightly different angle. If it is true that um, in, in interpretation, biblical interpretation especially, two, two horizons meet, the horizon of the, of the biblical text and the horizon of the reader, um, then the questions that we ask, the theological presuppositions that we have, the convictions that we have, the worries that we have, uh, the sinful inclinations that we struggle with, all of those things cannot but enter into that encounter and cannot but shape the meaning that eventually emerges from our from our struggle with the text. Yeah, I really loved the way that you said, I might butcher it here a little, but that the, the scriptural text and reading scripture it is not a puzzle to be solved, but a mystery to enter into. And that's not a kind of throw your hands up mystery, like who knows type of mystery or like a Scooby-Doo mystery, right? Where like by the yeah. end of the episode, yeah. we'll have it. But a truth that is inexhaustible, right? And, and something that we're mm -hmm. going ever further up and further in to use the language right. of C.S. Lewis. I love that. I, I could go on a whole tangent about mystery and we could have a whole episode on that, but we're not going to do that specifically. I do want, though, to get back to our friends, the medieval monks, and talk about Hugh of St. Victor and his mystic arc. This was one of the most intriguing parts of your book to me. The, the, the imagery here is fascinating, but also the practical usefulness of what he's doing with this mystic arc and how it gets at these ideas of memorization and could impact how we approach the text. I was just fascinated. It wasn't something I was familiar with and I really enjoyed it. So I want to be able to share it with people today. So to start, what is this mystic arc? What are we talking about here? Yeah, well, Hugh St. Victor um, does something very, for, to, to us moderns at least, something very strange when he's talking about the arc. Um, he he, um, he he deals with the arc a lot. The notion of arc comes to the fore in a number of different of his writings. So when you say the mystic arc, well, then I'm I'm, I'm thinking of one thing in particular. But first, we should contextualize it and say, Hugh talks about arcs all over the place. The arc of your heart, uh, the arc of Noah, um, the various levels of the of the arc of Noah. Um, he he writes he writes. Uh, four books uh, or a book with four parts, you could also say uh, on the Ark of Noah. Um, and basically what he does in, in, in all of that is he maps um, the entire history of salvation as well as the entire, um, the entire life of the soul uh, onto that Ark. And, and the reason why he uses an Ark for this is is well the ark is 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 the church uh, often um if, if you enter in a, in a, an older church building um it's structured like a boat like a ship like an ark um and and there's a reason for that because the, the billows of the storm of the sea uh, threaten often to undo us um Hugh of saint victor talks about our swirling thoughts they're not just outside there they're actually inside inside the the the, the waves um are, are the are the, the thoughts that that assail us the distractions that we face um our disordered lives and and we need stabilitas we need stability insists insists Hugh. we need some kind of order and therefore he gives us this ark the ark of noah which, which becomes for him like a memory palace. He maps, as I said, the whole history of salvation as well as the, the life of the soul onto that memory palace, onto that, onto that boat, onto the ark. He fits everything in it, literally almost everything of, that you find in the scriptures. Everything gets its place. Um, he, he also has what, what you called in your question, I think the mystic ark, which, which is a, a huge, um, a huge painting that he uh, put somewhere in the cloister walk, uh, um, probably in 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 um, in in the, in the um, Abbey of Saint Victor, 
and and he, he gives a, a picture there of the ark of noah and again there he he doesn't write this time as he does in his in his various books on the ark but he he paints there um for 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 the other monks um the content of the same kind of content that he also gives gives or describes in his books um we're not 100 percent sure that he actually had a painting like that um in 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 a, in a cloister walk somewhere um <clears throat> but it seems he probably did certainly he writes about it in in the fourth book on the in his fourth book on the art he, he writes about it as though he has a painting somewhere so, um so um the memory palace the painting the images it's all meant to facilitate the meditation slash memorization of 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 the monks um, to whom he explains the content of the painting that he has depicted uh, in the book i give various pictures of this ark of noah how it, how it functioned um, remarkable detail uh, he was a man of great great detail um, and he's hoping i mean we're inundated with images through through film uh time uh, through through the computer and we were always faced with images it was different in the 12th century and for the monks to to see these pictures and to have them explained by their abbot in every detail would be an unforgettable experience and um and it would instill in their mind the contents of um of 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 the entire history of salvation and and it would help them memorize and retain um the scriptures so that so that they could then in their own mind meditate on it again and again even without having the pictures pictures in front of them so in the age of Lagos and the Bible app, and I suppose now you could ask like chat GPT, like, where is this verse, right? I think we're, you, we're losing something of that discipline of memorization. Our phone has all the information we'd ever need, and we don't really re need to remember many things. What do we lose in our reading of scripture when we don't practice memorizing scripture? Um, in, in, we lose our Christian identity in the end. Um, the 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 I have a Logos prog program on my on my computer. Um, I use it, um, but I, I I am only too keenly aware of of the drawbacks. And this is no 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 um, criticism of the uh, developers of, of of the Logos program. Um, it's simply to observe that whatever is in your computer is well in your computer. Um, it, it it doesn't do anything there's no connection between the computer and you there only can be a connection between the computer and you personally uh, when you study it and when it when you memorize it when somehow it becomes part of you what is in my head can shape me positively or negatively only what's in my head only something that's in my head can shape me positively or negatively um, some kind of memorization uh, must be part of the christian life now we we tend to associate memorization with with a negative uh term of rote uh, memorization and it, it becomes a problem for us and so we we shove it aside um actually rote memorization i think has a lot going for it um, but one way or another, one way or another, um, the scriptures need to seep into our bones, as it were. Um, when one day you and I are, are going to be on our deathbed, we want to be able to recount the scriptures to ourselves. If you can memorize them and say a psalm out loud, that'd be lovely. Um, but one way or another, uh, we need to go back to how God has revealed himself to us in the divine scriptures. Um, without memory, we have no future. Um, 
St. Thomas Aquinas is really good on this. Without memory, there's no prudential foresight because prudence has to do with weighing from, ex from what you've experienced and what now is in your memory, what you should do next. So the past and the future, memory and prudence are connected. Um, that's why dementia is such a debilitating sickness. Um, it not only removes your memory, but it means you lose your, your future. And by losing your future, you also lose your identity. It's, it's, it's an excruciating thing. Um, so so um, memorization is something we must recover in the church for the church to have a future. That is very well said. We've covered a lot of ground today, and it's been such a joy and pleasure for me. I mean, we've gone from Guigo to Hugh of St. Victor. We've talked about Aquinas. We've talked about, we've covered just an immense amount of ground. I want to bring it down to a really practical level as we land the plane here. If you were speaking to someone who's brand new to reading scripture, what advice do you give them to read the Bible and to encounter God in it? What I, what, I do, what I would do first is say, look, um, you need to be on your knees and you need to come to church. On your knees before you enter into the scriptures for yourself. Read one of the gospels um, and, and come to church with me. For the church is a very otherworldly place and it's in the church that you learn how to read the scriptures for yourself. Um, I would not ask the person, take this commentary. I would not advise the person, take this commentary and you'll, read, you'll, you'll learn how to read the scriptures rightly. I would say, look, come with me to this otherworldly place, this strange place where we worship God, where we enter into heaven, and where by entering into heaven, we also learn how to read the scriptures, where we learn how to relate the Old Testament passage to the New Testament passage every week again. Um, those, are the, those are the two things that, that I think are key. A, prayer before someone reads a Psalm or a gospel, and B, come to church not a seeker-friendly affair, but a very otherworldly affair. Oh, I could have a whole conversation on that. That was wonderful. <laughs> what, what wonderful yes, advice. <laughs> because, I mean, but honestly, sadly for so many people, they could walk into a church and they might not hear, a, I mean, they might hear a sermon about Scripture, but they might not hear a reading from Scripture. And when you talk about having that otherworldly experience, I pray that that's what people find in their churches and that they're in a place where they're hearing that, that reading from the Old and the New Testament, the Psalms, um, and that they're learning to read Scripture in and with the church. Um, and as a theologian, oh, on his knees in, in confession and prayerfully. Um, so, so may that be so. I want to wrap up, as I always do on this uh, channel, with a couple rapid-fire questions. Once again, this has been a pleasure, and uh, I do want to recommend uh, so highly to everyone that they do check out your book, Pierced by Love. Uh, it's out from Lexham Press. You can find it online, and I'll have links to that. Um, but you also have, like I said at the beginning, over a dozen other books that I think they would really delight in. Um, but with that being said, to, to the final four, the, the questions that everyone on the channel answers in kind of a phrase, a sentence... Uh, so the first question is, what has been the most fruitful habit or spiritual discipline in your life? Probably um, reading scripture and praying with my family at the dinner table. I love that. Outside the Bible, what has been the most impactful book on your life? Uh, I would say um, Henri de Lubac's scripture in the tradition. Mm, that's a good one. I know that you do love the Nouvelle Theologians, so... Uh, very nice. You're having coffee with your undergrad school self or early or undergrad or early grad school self. What's one piece of advice you give him for his future in theology? Ask others for more advice than you did. Hmm. Don't always think you should do it your own way. 
There's a lot of wisdom there. The last question, this channel is named Gospel Simplicity. Sometimes the channel, the conversations get a bit complex, so we always bring it back to this question. In a sentence, what is the gospel? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Well, Dr. Borsma, this was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. And thanks to all of you who watch this video sometime in the future. I don't take your time lightly either. I'll close as I always do by saying until next time, be on the lookout for more videos. But as always, far more importantly than that, go out and love God and love others because truly above all else, that will change the world. You made it this far in the video and that means you had to have enjoyed it or I guess you walked away and forgot about it. But if you're still actually there, I want you to check really quick down down below, like right there. Are you subscribed to the channel? And, and if, if you're not, I mean, you just spent an hour with us. You might you might as well just hit hit subscribe. And you, you watched the whole video. I mean, maybe you could hit like. I, I don't know. I think it would be a good thing. It would show more people this video, and I would really appreciate it. So go ahead, subscribe, like. And if you want to be crazy and you want to help keep this channel going and growing, consider becoming a patron. You can do so at patreon.com slash gospel simplicity. 